Welcome to another broadcast of Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are archived. Visit ArtistFirst.com. And here he is, the host of the show. It's Arthur D. Schwartz. Why, hello, everybody. Welcome to another show of Philosophic Perspectives. Well, uh, I have a very special guest tonight, and um, you all know him. It's Scott. Hi, Scott. How are you? In other words, you couldn't get anybody else. Huh? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you poor man. Well, well you know, um, I, Scott and I have had, have had many conversations since I've been involved with the uh, the Artist First Network, and um, and so I figured, uh, why not uh, you know share that with uh, some of our you know our you know my listeners here, and uh, as well, um, I would. As my, you know, my show is uh, concerned with philosophic perspectives. I'm always looking for uh, different views, different ideas, different ways of looking at things. And um, on the Artist First Radio Network, there's uh, a number of really interesting shows um, that uh, you know uh, do that. And so, one of the main things that I wanted to um, talk about today is the to just uh, bring in Scott and let him um, talk about some of the shows that uh, he thinks might have a, a common a bearing on the kind of work that I'm doing on the show. And um, that will be a springboard for uh, some great conversation, and it's an opportunity to, um, to you know, get an understanding of, um, you know, what's going on on the Artist First Radio Network in, in, a, in, a, in a great way because Scott's right in the center of the whole thing. So, Scott, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on with Artist First Radio Network and um, some of the shows that, um, well, you know me a little bit, so that uh, would resonate with um, the kind of work that I'm doing. Well, I think uh, for this audience, uh, the shows that they might be interested in would be uh, Project Urantia, probably first and foremost. That program originally began as the Riley Martin Show. Um, had a public fight with Howard Stern. They won, and they took the show over there to uh, Sirius Radio. And, and uh, the plot behind it is there were several people abducted in the 1970s, mm-hmm. and uh, a group of people were all taken to the same location. And uh, one of the other individuals that was there with Riley has taken over the show. It's Michael in Maui, we call him. And uh, he was a former Lutheran minister. Who, uh, Anyway, this, this, uh, this program, uh, Project Urantia, first of all, Urantia is the word, the name for this planet from the celestial beings that inhabit a spaceship called the New Jerusalem of all things. It's moored off the rings of Saturn. You can look at NASA has taken pictures of it. It's all over the web. Uh, it's a illuminated anomaly, according to NASA. Now, Ar- Arthur, what, what other illuminated objects are there in the solar system besides the sun? Stars. They're not in our solar system. Oh, oh, in no, our solar system. Oh. Anyway, that's the premise of that program, that alien beings... Celestial beings, angels, gods, call them what you want. There's, there's an intelligence has been shaping the history of this world. Some might argue that we are a, a laboratory for colonies, that some of the vanished civilizations like the Incas and other civilizations that have vanished were taken off the planet because they were genetically pure at the time, and they didn't want the uh, genetic experiment to be. But boy, I'm really going way off on a tangent here. No, uh, it's fine with me. Okay, that's Project Urantia. There's 275 episodes that you guys can binge on right now. Uh, Dr. Robert Newton is a newcomer to our station. He is very well educated and, and very interested in science and mysteries of the world. He studies all the major world religions. All right, hacking up a furball there. Thank God I have a cough drop here. Um, and uh, conspiracies, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a, it, we deliberately put that program immediately following Project Urantia because we think uh, there's a coattail audience. If you'd be interested in one, you might be interested in the other. Uh, another program that's sort of out there, quote unquote, is our Bigfoot Central program. Uh We've been running this program since 1997. 
before we even had a station. We were a syndicated program. Uh, one of our guests, hosts, was on the Art Bell show a number of years ago. Some of your listeners might remember Art Bell. Sure. And he named the program because we had such a reputation for being the original and most productive Bigfoot program. He, uh, he renamed the show Bigfoot Central, and it stuck all these years later. We get over 100,000 people that listen to that program. It's a once-a-monther. Um, and you know what? In a court of law, you would win the case under circumstantial evidence that Bigfoot exists. Oh. It, it, it's not even a question anymore. Uh, right. Anyway, that program is based on that. So there's been some literally groundbreaking information uh, that's been revealed on that program. There's a whole bunch of videos that accompany... The radio broadcast, you click on the radio link. Uh, uh, actually, first you'd want to click on the, the pictures and video page and then listen to the broadcast because they discuss each picture and video in detail. Um, offhand, uh, my brain is tired like yours is. I'm trying to think if there's other paranormal type. Then there's this Arthur D. Schwartz show with this real <laughs> uh, cool guy from Boston who uh, is killing it, man. Uh, I really love your show. Oh, thank you, Scott. You buy, there is no question, and I'm not patronizing you in any way. You are the, the most highbrow show on our station, and we love it. <laughs> highbrow. Well, I don't know how else to call it. I don't want to sound, <laughs> it's not geeky. That's not the right, right word. It's a very intellectual program. Uh, always love philosophy, religion, mysteries of the world. Your electric car program was dead on. Right. Yeah, well, you know, uh, that's one thing. Uh, well, actually, I would all, uh, get back to something that you said. Uh, it's kind of a segue to some, something else. But when you talked about uh, Bigfoot, would um, the evidence for Bigfoot would hold up in the court of law? And that's a, that's an argument that I use many times because um, it shows you the schism, you might say, between uh, what we consider acceptable evidence when we talk in terms of science, um, but the evidence. Uh, for UFOs, you know, for paranormal, you know, phenomena, you know, for Bigfoot, like you're saying, and, and things like that, uh, you know, alternative or paranormal phenomena, um, would hold up in a court of law because a court of law does not require test tube evidence uh, because um, it recognizes that the entire world cannot be proved in a test tube or in a laboratory. And so there's all kinds of, you know, thresholds for evidence. Um, sure, scientific evidence is great. Now, you know, now we're getting the DNA evidence and all that. Uh, but still, uh, uh, you know, for example, in UFOs, we have uh, thousands of people who uh, witness these things, and uh, and you have credible witnesses, and you have other evidence that's left on the ground, weird radiation and and after effects and things like that, and. Uh, witnesses by airplane pilots and radar trackings and the whole shebang, uh, but because it's not a controlled experiment, it's uh, basically dismissed as being a laughable thing that no one really in, in um, mainstream media takes seriously. Um, so I mean, that's really that, that line of uh, reasoning about um, uh, a court of law. It would pass in a court of law. It would hold up in a court of law. Is, is it really a, a very persuasive one, I think, because it, it says something about um, how mainstream, how, how the, I would say the mainstream uh, institutions uh, restrict the introduction of ideas by tying things down because, well, um, well, we, we can't prove it. Of course, the only way you can prove a UFO, UFO, which has been often said, is it's going to have to land on the White House, uh, White House lawn and you, know, you come out and meet the president. Uh, then they might start taking it seriously. Uh, so, you know, I really, uh, I really like that, um, that comment. Now, segueing into something else about evidence and what constitutes uh, credible evidence for belief, such as a UFO or Bigfoot or parapsychology and so forth and so on. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do in my show is uh, I would call it, uh, describe it as uh, awakening the inner philosopher. I believe that uh, we all have a philosopher in us. 
uh, it, which is clearly demonstrable because people get in all kinds of arguments of, of a philosophical nature all the time, but um, they wouldn't call philosophy because philosophy is not really seen as such. It's as a, you know, seen as it's something uh, particularly academic. But um, we all have an inner philosopher, and I think that's so important because uh, this is the world, the world we live in. I think it's, it's so needed today. And when we look around the world, this is, it's kind of, uh, unfortunately, you know, this tragedy that we just went through in Paris, and we see uh, what's become of the world, you know? I mean, what's the what's become of the world, and 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 the and what what um, uh, you know held up as as rational, um, and that's what's going on. And and of course, there's always been extremism uh, in the past, but in the modern world, I think it's, uh, it's taking on a totally different dimension uh, for a lot of different reasons. Some of it's difficult to understand. Um, but probably it's simply that um, uh, with uh, the world uh, technology, any crackpot can become a power to be reckoned with. I think that's the difference today, you know. And we're worried about you know, um, you know, a-, a bombs in a suitcase and that type of thing. So that's the scary thing about the world today. So. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, just my that's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, what do you think about what just happened in uh, last week or over the weekend, Scott? Well, it, it's not surprising. It will happen here. It will ha- start happening all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, we are going to have to fight a yeah. war with fundamental fundamentalist Islam. Uh, there really has been no other path clear since, well, the very suspicious 9-11. But the, uh, as you guys know, it's come out that uh, Ronald Dumsfeld and Dick Cheney for 10 years before that had come up with reasons to go in and take Saddam Hussein's oil. Uh, the mess we have created over there, history will not be kind to George W. Bush or Dick Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, Paul Bremer. They messed up big time. And the Middle East, which had a lot of problems, a lot of bad people over there, was a much better place than it is now. We are $3 trillion in the hole. ISIS, who uh, the, we equipped the Iraqi army when we left with all of our weapons, all of our great first-of-line tanks, mortars, missiles, and when they were confronted by ISIS, they turned and ran like little schoolgirls. Right. And you know what? In, in all honesty, I suppose that was a harsh comment. The only thing that had held Iraq together in the past was a strong, brutal, murderous dictator named Saddam Hussein. And in the Arab world, there is no democracy. Arabs don't care one crap about democracy. Uh, Saddam Hussein, being a brutal dictator, was able to hold that artificially created country together and at the same time keep people like, I don't know, uh, Iran, as a matter of fact, keep them occupied. Uh, And then we went in there and screwed it up, and they botched it when Bremer fired all of the people that ran the country and said you can, those with the bath party, said you're all fired and you can never work in this in these fields again, well, guess who joined ISIS? Guess who's running ISIS? Saddam Hussein's generals that were kicked out by Paul Bremer. They're experts in war. They've been fighting wars for their entire lives. And now we've got a very, very big problem. Uh, we're going to have to fight a war of religion. It's, that's what it's coming down to. If France, here's a question for you, Arthur, if France follows through and uh, presenting an argument to NATO, which is, hey, we're part of NATO, and right, our alliance right. is, if one of us is attacked, then we're all attacked. Right. It's a pretty tough argument to say that Paris wasn't attacked. Oh, they definitely were. So are we going to look at, now, now we were talking about this on Project Urantia last night. You know, if you read the book of Revelation, and it talks about Armageddon, which is a geographic location. It's an actual place you can go stand in. It's a plane in the Middle East. I don't know if it's actually in Israel, but it's over there somewhere. It's an actual location, Armageddon. 
And as the book of Revelation says, you know, all the countries of the world will meet there and there'll be a great world war. Well, that sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo until recently. If NATO says, okay, let's go in there and beat up ITIS, then you're going to have 25, 30 countries sending troops with guns to kill people over there. And then you'll have all the other fundamentalist Muslims all over the world joining in. So there could actually be, I can see now a scenario that was absolutely ridiculous a couple of weeks ago. Right. That may, who knows, maybe that gosh darn Bible knows what it's talking about. But yeah, no, it's, it's, it's religious war. And it, Islam, I've read the book. Uh, I don't know, it's affected. I have one in my bathroom, the Quran. Very beautiful uh, copy of the Quran. It's a wonderful document. You can believe it if you want to. There is no nothing in the Quran about treating women <clears throat> like slaves and separate citizens. There's nothing in the Quran about slaughtering Muslims by the tens of thousands. And who's killing more Muslims on the planet today than anybody else? That's right, ISIS. Right. I'm sorry to, to go into this diatribe here about this, but uh, there is no avoiding it. You can't kill an idea. Uh, well, you, I don't think you can... Well, I don't. I, I wouldn't phrase it that way. Ideas do go out of fashion, so it's not like ideas can change. Uh, of course, religious ideas. I mean, they're stubborn, aren't they? I mean, they just stick around. Um, the thing with ISIS, uh, you know, they're they're. If it is indeed a form of uh, of Islam, it's an ancient form of you know, going back to the to what the 15th century or something oh beyond before that well muhammad uh during a period of started the age in, or something. it was in the six six hundreds is when muhammad right. created the religion right but i mean they, their version is very ancient i mean and you know it's uh so uh, you, you know it's you know i you want to i mean i i want to believe that it's just uh, an exception and I, i'm sure it is the question is we don't really know how extensive it is or not but you, you know, uh, you, you made a comment about um, uh, you know Saddam Hussein, um, you know, is holding Iraq together. But it's it's not so much a religion, a religious issue, um, or not. Uh, I, I think you can see the same thing when the uh, Soviet Union uh, dissolved, uh, and you had places like um, uh, Yugoslavia, and all. You know, what happened is, you know, suddenly, you know, the, the Soviet Union was, uh, you know, suppressing, you know, the ethnic divisions. But when the Soviet Union crumbled, all those ethnic divisions just you know, reemerged, like in Bosnia and in Herzegovina, you know, the war back in the 90s. All those yeah. ethnic um, divisions, uh, you know, reemerged because uh, the Soviet Union wasn't repressing them. And so that's an, that's an interesting thing, but I, it's an, that's an interesting question, isn't it, about, well... Do you justify a dictatorship because it's capable of repressing the hatred within a society in, in terms of because, because uh, it has to be subjugated to the central you know, government of, um, of the dictatorship? And neither, neither one is good, is it? <laughs> right? No, I, I agree. I, I mean, you know, Soviet Union, I wouldn't want to live there. But then again, you want to live uh, uh, when there's a you know, racial uh, you know, division and ethnic cleansing, as they called it during that war, is recall. Um, you know, in, in Serbia and uh, Herzegovina, and um, and what was the other country? Um, Serbia. Well, Serbia, Herzegovina, and there's one other. Um, um, uh, Croatia, and uh, they. Uh, so that, that they're both terrible. I mean, it's too. So uh, the thing is. I'm just an idealist. Uh, I I think that you know, I'm gonna, let's let's go back full circle about you know the, like for example what my show is about. Uh, I believe so much in the idea of open intellectual um, inquiry, which is not tied down by you know the pre preconceptions of religious or ideological, or I should say religious and ideological dogma. Because to me, that's the scourge of the world. That's what's happening, of course. Uh, what's you know happening now in the Middle East, you know, with ISIS, or as I I prefer to call, call um, as the French do, um, Daesh. That, that I prefer that word. <laughs> ISIL, so, ISIL sounds ridiculous, 
And Isis sounds glorified, could be associated with the Egyptian god. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the other one sounds like a Korean car manufacturer. <laughs> right. Well, now, now uh, Daesh, um, for some reason they don't like that word I've read, but I don't exactly understand why. I think it's just the actual Arab acronym for ISIS. But for some reason I've read that ISIS, you know, that, uh, that they don't actually like that, that word, but I don't really know why. Um, I think I think somehow the, the sound of the word has uh, something uh, um, a negative or perhaps an obscene connotation. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think there's something like that. Um, anyway, <laughs> well, you know, a, a side note to this: the uh, f- you know uh, one the main way that ISIS is making billions of dollars, they're a very profitable terrorist group, is through selling oil. They, oh, well, they yes. seized the uh, Western oil fields. Right. They just went and took it. Right. Uh, and, and they're able to sell you know, oil tankers full of black market oil, pun intended, on the, uh, all around the world. People will buy it. So the first thing the French did yesterday mm. was start bombing those oil processing facilities. Go ahead and pump it. What are you going to do with it then? Uh, and it has a twofold benefit. Number one, you're doing something to appear to try and disrupt ISIS. Number two, it should lead to higher gas prices, <laughs> and that will help. You know, usually, oh, it's a, a woman at an oil refinery got a hangnail today, so we have to double the price of gas. They used right. to come up with bullshit reasons to raise gas, the most ridiculous, unbelievable excuses, but they can do what they want. And this is a great excuse, and it will restrict the amount of barrels on the market, and it should have a natural inflationary effect for the price of oil, and that will, for many Americans, my, my neighbor who has two fracking trucks yeah. that takes the, you know, he's they're barely working. They can't wait, so. Oh, I see. Oh, I yeah, see. I mean, the, the, you know, the oil companies have been closing left and right. They can't, the, the wells aren't profitable. The uh-huh. oil price is too, it's been killing the Saudis. It's also been killing Russia. It's been one of the most painful things for Russia to go through because they rely I don't know. They need oil at about a hundred dollars a barrel to, to to kick butt. And I, I haven't really looked at oil recently. What is it? Sixty, fifty, something like that. Uh, per barrel? Yeah, I I, ha- sure I wouldn't know. know. I haven't looked. I used right. to look at that kind of uh-huh. stuff every day. But but again, Russia will benefit from that big time. Putin needs some extra cash. We're trying to strangle him with the with the boycott uh-huh. stuff. Right. And all he needs is the price of gas to go up. And bingo, he's back in the money. So anyway, just now is that a side thing? Is that just a What's that? Is that a just a convenient result of French's uh, France's attack? Uh, um, well, you're, you're pro- probably a little bit more of a cynic than I am. I mean, I think they genuinely did that, uh, you know, in retaliation. Yeah, I'm not saying that. That the, the I meant when the French uh-huh. decided to strike back at ISIS. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know that in their minds that they were saying, "Hey, let's rise the price. Let's raise right, the price right. of gas." I didn't mean the, uh, uh, the right. suicide bombers. Right. Right, no, right, no, but I mean, I, I don't think they did it. You know, they, 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 they figured, hey, here's a great way to raise prices, so it would have benefit the West. Now, uh, but I go back to my original premise. Uh, when you know, you're not fighting. I don't know the emperor of Japan or some insane Adolf Hitler. You're fighting uh, people who make their way in the world, cloaking themselves in quote unquote religion, and. My goodness, uh, the sales techniques of ISIS people. Think about this for a minute. When you can go get a 25-year-old, presumably intelligent human being, and talk them into killing themselves for you, that's a pretty good sales pitch. I bet there's car dealerships all over the world would love to know what they're telling those people. But again, without well, religion, you know, they, they can't. Yeah, well, what? How many? How many versions? I forget. Versions of. <laughs> you know, <laughs> suicide. You go to, isn't that the thing? You go to heaven and. and oh, 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 yeah. And 72 versions. 72 versions. Well, what about the women? Now they got girls blowing themselves oh, up. I'm not yeah, sure. The, well, maybe, yeah, the women blow herself up yesterday. Maybe they're part of the LBGT community. Yeah, God, I don't God know. bless them. You know, right, more I, power I wonder to what her benefit is. Yeah. Right. We're going to get hate mail for that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Oh, well. Um,. Yeah, it's 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 uh, a crazy world. You know, I want to comment on oil, though. This is one of my my pet subjects too. When you look at the fluctuation of oil, you know, forget about the war going on now. I mean, this just goes up and down like a yo-yo. And to me, that 
says something fundamental about um, the basis of value. Um, so you justify that because, well, of course, it's supply and demand. But the thing is, it's so contrived. I mean, it's true. If there was actually a free market with no monopoly and no ability to manipulate it, then um, you know you would have a nice argument for having a free market. But this isn't a free market. It's been, you know, particularly uh, in things like oil and other things too, but particularly in things like oil. Um, they're just playing around with it all the time. It's going up and down. And, so, and, and, and just the fact that something can, be, can vary so radically and so drastically from day to day and week to week. And I, I think the price of oil now has gone down right at one point. I think it was double a couple of years ago, right? Now it's close to $2. It beginning begin to go up again, but it was close to $2 at the pump. Uh, oh, yeah, about four you, about uh, two years ago. Oh, exactly, almost four dollars a gallon. Not that long ago. I, I mean, so to me, I just I have a hard time. It, what's creating the value? Obviously, I mean, the, the the idea of a free market would be you know supply and demand as it naturally occurs in the marketplace, and so and a commodity or a product would have a certain value. Um, because that's the demand of the market and the, and the ability of manufacturers and others, you know, to to provide it. But in this situation, or in, in uh, if it's in the case of natural resources as well, I mean, um, if uh, uh, the, the, if it becomes naturally scarce, a, pro, a commodity becomes naturally scarce, and one would think that the price would go higher. If there's a, if there's more in the market, if the market is flooded with it, it will be cheaper. But that would be on the basis of natural conditions that cause that. What we have here is just manipulation of one form or the other, uh, and um, or or you know right now we're talking about the war. That's probably not fair because the war that that sure that's not necessarily planned. But like you said, it's possibly possibly is planned. But forget about the war. This is going on from year to year to year, it, and it's just going up and down. And to me, it just shows you the limitations of uh, of free market. Um, sometimes a controlled market is a much more natural market than a free market. Because a controlled market would compensate for these fluctuations. What do you think about that? Well, I think you're right. I, I agree with what you say. I, I think there's a huge factor you didn't mention, and that are the, the wonderfully generous and compassionate people on Wall Street. The commodities brokers. Like you say, when a, an item starts to become scarce, those... Uh, Hedge fund managers and those uh, commodity brokers, they'll go buy it up. Right. Drive like like that asshole. Excuse my crude language, listeners, but right. there's sometimes it's the right word to use. Right. The guy that went and bought the patent on that drug and then raised the price by 1,700%. So, so uh, you know, anyway, again, Wall Street is 100% responsible for added costs to many, many, many. Everything from sugar to pork bellies to butter to whatever, home right. heating oil. Right. They buy futures, they drive up the price, and they make obscene profits, and we all pay more. Right. Well, actually, we, we could, um, we're going to take a break, uh, Scott. Um, so, but I think um, when we come back, I'm, we might segue into one of my favorite subjects in terms of markets, the currency market. This is Arthur D. Schwartz. You know, beliefs and disbeliefs can be very powerful. Much like philosophy, hypnotism is concerned with belief. Hypnotherapy, a practical application of hypnotism, may largely be described as the practice of removing false beliefs that form mental blocks to success, to happiness, and to well-being. In my hypnotherapy, and philosophical counseling practice, I combine my work in philosophy with hypnotism in order to clear mental blockages that can occur on both conscious and subconscious levels. A mental block may be conscious or subconscious, 
and can be expressed, for example, in the form of anxiety, low self-esteem or low motivation, bad habits, tobacco habits, weight gain, low performance, and much more. If you are interested in using hypnosis and the power of the mind to overcome mental blocks and barriers that have emerged in your life, please feel free to give me a call at 617-964-4800 or visit www.integralhypnosis.com. That's I N T E G R A L Hypnosis. Dot com. You are listening to Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. Here's your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Well, welcome back. I have Scott with me, uh, a Z Man, as he's called at the station. And is that right, Z Man? Yeah, we've got a few hate, well, <coughs> hate mail. Oh, you got some hate mail coming in? You want me to read one? Sure. Z-Man, thank you in advance for immediately killing yourself. <laughs> Signed, Love Mom. <laughs> so, love who? Some, my mom. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Glad you're listening. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm silly. Um, well, you know, when we left, um, we were talking about the oil, um, the, the radical swings, and, um, and Scott was getting into the uh, question of um, uh, the, uh, the commodity markets and the stock market and, and, uh, and the way that that can be manipulated sometimes. Um, but uh, I'm really interested in the currency market because I'm personally okay with bidding on companies, you know, stocks and bonds and that type of thing. Uh, but the idea of bidding on the currency seems oxymoronic to me. You're bidding, it's like basically bidding on, you know, uh, if, if, uh, if, if measurement, you know, in America we have feet, okay? So you want to bid on what's a foot, how long is a foot going to be this month? Uh, that's what we're doing with the currency market, bidding on currency. I don't quite understand how that makes any kind of sense, because just like you, you were talking about where the, um, the price of these um, you know, uh, commodities and uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, financial instruments um, are manipulated, the same thing happens in the currency market. By by all kinds of uh, investors for all kinds of different reasons, like politics, you know, or 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 projections of what the new president or prime minister, or whatever, is going to, um, what kind of policies he or she is going to be promoting, and and all kinds of all kinds of extraneous things that goes into the price of the currency, and so uh, I think it's a crazy system. I th- it's not a. It's actually um, not a coincidence that um, the the dollar, the value of a dollar, in relationship to an ounce of gold, has shrunk enormously since uh, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Uh, the dollar is not worth anywhere near what you know, relatively speaking, to a price. Of gold. I think it's less than. It's, I think it's gone up well over ten times, ten tenfold. M- m- way I think now at one time was one, at one time it was ten fold. I think now it's much higher. And so uh, that is really uh, a problem, I think, in our financial system. Um, because our currencies really don't mean anything, in my view. I totally agree. It's all, I don't want to say shell game, I don't want to say Ponzi game, but well, let me back up. Maybe instead of the word bidding on currency, the, maybe a more appropriate word is betting on currency. Those guys aren't, are doing, in well, yeah. my opinion, the same thing they could go do down at the horse track or at a boxing match or football game in you know, Las Vegas. Yeah, well, but the stock they, market too. I mean, well, they stand to make a lot more money betting on these things. 
Right. And, you know, I think greed and greed and greed mm-hmm. are the top three reasons why these people do what they do. They make right. a hell of a lot of money. Right. I, I think the gold standard was better. I mean, actually, in, in my book, I actually um, proposed a quasi gold standard, but not really. But it, it's basically um, ultimately pegged to gold. But it's. Um, the the goal the old gold standard had problems as well, but at least it was um, something that uh, uh, was more stable than what we have right now. Uh, what I what I uh, recommend is actually um, a kind of a, a board of interna- an international board where um, the a value of a um, of a of uh, I'm, sh- I'm sorry the 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 value of a currency in re, in relation to an ounce of gold would be determined objectively by an international you know not uh, impartial balanced board of experts by looking at you know certain economic indicators uh, to make that judgment and so therefore you'd have a lot of stability um, because um, uh, the different economies will always be referenced. It doesn't have to be gold. It's just that traditionally speaking, it's been gold for various different reasons. Gold is a is a, is a good mineral to to base it, but it doesn't have to be gold per se. It's really uh, and by the way, you don't have to have Fort Knox. You don't have to. You don't need to store to store gold anywhere. It's, that's a, that's a fiction. All you all you need is is a uh, it's a basis uh, a reference point so that from here on out the fluctuations. Um, in currencies and 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 in, in their in, re, in their relationship to one another in terms of a, a, a constant standard with um, with gold. Now the the price of gold can go up and can go down, but the thing is the individual currencies would be referenced to that, so it wouldn't really affect the currencies themselves because it's constantly it's 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 a if it's a, you know X to if the value is X to the price of gold, if whether the gold is goes higher or lower, it's still going to maintain its same um, price level with respect to um, the other currencies because the other currencies are, are affected the same way. So it's a constant. Not necessarily. How do you how uh, so? Well, I, I, was, I was just listening to an essay recently, and it was uh, discussing this upcoming potential Pacific trade agreement that they has, you know, they're trying to put in. And they were talking about a similar agreement that – that Japan and the United States came to, I think it was in the 80s. The whole reason that this matters is that system you just were talking about sounds great, except for the fact that a country like Japan, right after we signed that trade agreement, they devalued their currency, which made all their products dirt cheap and all our products expensive, and they bombarded us. And they got a huge lopsided windfall gain to their economy and we got very little. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're trying to, to tie, tie currencies to a, some kind of honest gold value of some formula, how are you going to stop the politics? How are you yeah, no, st- no, yeah, but actually, um, so, you know, actually, in my proposal, I actually cover that. Uh, because um, they, um, the, 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 the currency cannot be valued or devalued by the central bank. It can only be valued or devalued um, by this international board, uh, you could call it a Supreme Court of Finance or something. In other words, their, their sole job would be to ascertain the value, the, the currency value of each um, of each currency. So they, a country wouldn't be able to do that. A country could expand the money supply or shrink the money supply, but um, the valuation of the currency would also be would always be determined by an international. Um, uh, you know, board of experts, uh, an evaluation board um, that would um, determine what the what the currency value would be, because there are there are economic indicators that can do that. They they would look at all kinds of things that basically, because you know that's an interesting that's a question. You know, what determines the value of a currency? Is it simply you know betting or bidding or whatever you want to call it, um, or is are there are there economic indicators that if objectively looked at, which have to do with uh, you know the size of the economy, um, the, you know the the material wealth of the economy, you know the material underbelly of the economy, and you know uh, the, the basically the wealth of the economy, um, and, and uh, these experts you know would, would determine those things, and so I would take 
valuing the currency out of the hands of the government, of the individual, you know, governments that, um, you know, that the currencies represent, taken out of their hands. So what, what I'm talking about is totally, you, um, it, it's a radical thing. I mean, no one, it's, it's not. Yeah, I, I agree. With, I, yeah. I'd like to see that happen to Yeah, well, yeah, you take a look at my, the, the section on my book. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I kind of proposed that, and um, I, I'd like someone, I mean, I, I'm waiting to hear, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to someone, someone to, um, you know, show me where I'm wrong. Because I do believe you can actually have a currency um, that is stable, and uh, but also that does not necessarily restrict development, like actually what a, what the old gold standard sometimes did do. So you can expand the money supply, but if you do so, it's going to affect your currency value. But it won't be determined by the government. Uh, it will be determined by you know a, an objective board, so to speak, of uh, uh, you know of international experts. Um, I, I call it. Um, so, yeah, basically, it's basically uh, you might say a um, you know an international you know a currency board, a world currency board, and they would just determine those things. And uh, and to me, it makes sense because um, the currency is the value of exchange. So it's it's like uh, you, you know it's like uh, if you in baseball when you come to the home park, you can decide you know. Uh, how many feet are between uh, first base and second base? Because you can you you can change the value of a footer. I mean, I know it's a kind of kind of a silly argument, but actually, when you are debating currency, when you are actually bidding on a currency, you are basically bidding on the measurement of value in the marketplace. So why should that be? In, why should that be in the hands of the government or in a particular society or a particular economy? Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a smart question, but we're a stupid society. They'll never give up that. <laughs> well, not our society. It's the world. I mean, the whole well, world. Then no, no government yeah. will give that up. Well, let's let's play along with that theory for uh-huh. a minute. What would have happened uh-huh. if, if that was the case? Let's say there was this international board uh-huh. that decided what the dollar was going to be worth, and you look up, and those sons of guns on Wall Street have collapsed the economy. Banks are failing left and right. Uh-huh. Nations are failing left and right because of a handful of greedy sons of bitches. And uh, AIG, hey, I need $65 billion. When? Monday. Or we're collapsing, you know, GM bankrupt, all these. Anyway, uh-huh. but because of a handful, a relatively small number of people caused this to happen, they made out obscene wealth they made out. Uh-huh. Now, what, what did our Federal Reserve do to solve this problem? They cranked up the printing press, and they printed trillions of dollars and injected it for free into right. the economy. Right. In your scenario, which I, I really like, but, but you know, what, that could never have happened. Yeah, they can print more money, but it's going to affect the currency. They won't decide what the currency value is. They can print more money, but the board will decide that that will, that will have an impact on the price of the dollar. And that would be that price will be determined by the board, not by the Federal Reserve or the Treasury, whomever. Of course, nowadays, of course, you realize uh, we governments don't uh, set the, the dollar, the, the value of the currency, um, uh, specifically um, because that's done by the bidding. But what they do is they influence it. So, um, but they can devalue it, right? Uh, um, they can't. You know, they you can't, can't upvalue, but you can devalue. You, they they can devalue it in effect. You, they can't outright devalue it because they don't. They don't. The value is based upon the market, the currency market, right? So the currency market. You know, the, the market uh, is determining the value of the currency. China. Um, I'm, what they? What did they do? I'm trying to remember that. Um, they had a bit of a bubble burst. Uh, a small bubble. Their stock market was raging along thirty percent a year, and then. Prices started to tank in a hurry. Right, but they, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, you can manipulate it, but you can't actually, it's not like when you had the gold standard where, you know, England would, you know, devalue, their, devalue the pound. Um, today, it's, it's based on the market, uh, um, but, the, you know, a, a, a bidding or, you know, betting, as you would say. However, um, they can influence um, that by, um, uh I'm t- I'm trying to remember exactly what they did, but the U.S. was was, was felt that they were uh, getting an unfair advantage, and I'm forgetting the, the particular circumstances. 
Uh, but um, the, when, you, when you say just devalue the currency, that, that was happening in the old days when uh, it was basically um, the uh, the currency was based again either the either the, um, uh, the ounce of gold or, or or sometimes the dollar. More recently, the dollar, which it was actually based upon a dollar which was pegged to gold. Um, but uh, what I'm what, the, what I'm talking about, um, y- you wouldn't really be able to. That would really wouldn't happen because. Um, what I'm suggesting is uh, a currency that is stabilized by uh, some an, uh, an object a board of a, a objective evaluators. So whenever there's any monkey, you know, monkeying around with the currency, they're going to adjust the value of the currency. They're going to keep it. They're going to keep it true to um, what, you know the ounce of gold or whatever would be the um, the you know the the mineral that uh, is used as a standard. So how do we get away from money? How do we get away from banks? I was just listening on the radio to that uh, today about uh, something is sort of the Uberization. I think it was on PBS. I think it was in the car listening to the. I think it was this morning when I was coming to my office, and um, uh, they were talking about the Uberization of banks, and uh, they were actually. And I, I it was a little bit beyond me. I, I really didn't have time to listen to it carefully, but essentially they're having these apps now that are basically bypassing. Um, conventional banks, which is pretty exciting. I kind of like my idea of creating a reality TV show and uh, all those sons of bitches that caused the financial crisis. Put them on a desert island, and then we can have a reality TV show called <laughs> Let's... That's true. They none of, no, 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 no. no. Here's jail. the best part. <laughs> Let's hunt a banker. They got... Ever seen that program, Naked and Stupid, that's on... Uh-huh. Uh, Right. Well, this would be just like that. They'd have naked bankers running through the jungle, and you could hunt them for a fee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you could use the money to uh, help restore the lion population in Africa. I'd rather have lions than... Uh, uh, that's just wishful thinking. Okay. <laughs> you said hate mail to DJ at artistfirst.com. We better take a break to get my, my final ads in. Are you a person who enjoys intellectual social interaction and finds digging deeper into the nature of things, from big issues to everyday life, an important part of the pleasure of life? Social Philosophizers is a Boston-area social club for those who desire intellectual socializing. It's a club for both singles and non-singles, and for anyone who finds intellectually mingling to be the best form of social mingling. The club offers a variety of interesting venues such as philosophical get-togethers in private venues, book discussions concerning literature and philosophy, topical discussions over brunch or dinner, guest speakers, theater, after-work mixers, even long philosophical ruminations along nature trails or city streets and more. If you live in the greater Boston area or occasionally spend time in the area, you can choose a cost-effective membership level that's right for you. Basic membership is free. Find the link on Arthur's Philosophical Perspectives show page at artistsverse.com or just search socialphilosophizers.com. We hope you'll join Social Philosophizers today. That's socialphilosophizers.com. In Ethical Empowerment... Virtue Beyond the Paradigms, Arthur D. Schwartz presents an ethical theory that is a framework for evaluating moral conundrums that go beyond legalistic rulemaking, dogmatism, and preconditioned thinking. The book is as much an ethical framework for unconventional ideas as it is for staying with convention. Ethical empowerment is a manifesto of non-doctrinaire perspective. Ultimately, the hypnotic thinking of ideology and dogmatism can only be overcome by returning to the true source and essence of morality, which is nothing less than universal love. Discover how the philosophically liberating approach of the ethical empowerment can be applied to the range of ethical, social, and political controversy. Read about a plan to eliminate all political parties. Entertain the possibility of an overhaul of the patent system 
and its replacement with a system that rewards inventors while eliminating monopolistic control of patents and technological suppression. Many other transformative ideas are discussed in the book, including issues related to the monetary system, real estate, scientific paradigms, and a rational approach to conspiracy theory. While ethical empowerment will challenge your mind to consider new perspectives, the ethical challenge is always to keep the diversity, depth, and breadth of perspective within the boundaries of love. Ethical Empowerment is available at Amazon.com and most online booksellers in both print and ebook editions. Thanks for joining us on Philosophic Perspectives. Back to your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, well, you know, I've really enjoyed having uh, Scott on the show with me. I really appreciate him coming on. And um, this, I like to just talk a little bit about um, my view on um, independent um, programming, independent uh, artists, independent authors, independent filmmakers, uh, independent, independent um, creativity. And, uh, you know, I, I got into this uh, really when I, I, I self-published my, uh, my book uh, a couple of years ago, really, and then I... In 03 and in 04, I came out with the second edition, and um, and then I got uh, involved with Artist First Radio, and this whole world of uh, independent creativity um, is such an exciting thing, and I think it's so important, uh, really, um, to foster that, and uh, it's really an honor to be associated with a, 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 an institution like Artist First Radio. Um, and I, I would like to uh, to see um, the, this. I would like to hopefully play a part in uh, making um, these kinds of things a more vital uh, and integral um, a part of of um, of our society. Because honestly, uh, there is so much conformity that stifles creativity. That's a little bit oxymoronic, isn't it? Conformity stifling creativity. Um, that uh, something has to be done about it. I, I think uh, when you start watching TV, and you know, the th you see so much, uh, so much that is just the same old, same old repetition. Uh, and I think for a society to be to maintain its vitality its creativity, its innovation. Uh, we have to avail ourselves of a multiplicity, a broad spectrum um, of, uh, of, of ideas. I think that's the, the, a true spirit of, of America. I really do. Uh, we are the, um, a land of diversity, of independence, of free thinking, of freedom of speech. Uh, and yet, I think we're living in a period of time where that is being endangered. So I think this whole movement of independent um, uh, organizations that support independent authors and, and musicians and uh, filmmakers and so forth and so on uh, is uh, it's something that uh, must be must be promoted. And I think it is catching on. It's part of the you know uh, the internet. I think. Uh, because it is making it possible for these things to exist. However, the truth, uh, if the truth be told, it uh, doesn't. It is not. It's not. As, it's not really uh, a major uh, counterpoint uh, to uh, the convention, the, or the conventional um, mainstream, you might say. So, I've actually mentioned to Scott that I, I would be interested in seeing uh, some of the different shows. Uh, you mentioned a few of them. Uh, on Artist First Radio, um, doing some interchanges of various types. I think that that would be a, a wonderful thing. Um, in my group, Social Philosophizers, the Social Philosophizers Club, I'm having a hard time getting it uh, going in this direction. But in any event, I'm going to continue to try to uh, to, to create um, a platform for independent authors and authors to give them a chance to uh, share their ideas, 
with folks who want to attend. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm having a hard time with it. Um, I'm not sure if it's the right venue or not. But I'm going to continue to work at this because I believe it, it uh, with all my uh, heart and soul. And if anybody is listening out there who is an independent author, a filmmaker, an artist, uh, who's doing creative work, or intellectual work, um, that you uh, feel you need a voice and you have done some work, not just ideas, it has to be something that got, has gotten to the point of uh, creating something that's tangible, whether it's written material or uh, or, or, other, or other kind of some, uh, whatever medium, it has to be a medium that's existing, not just uh, a great idea, which is important. You've got to start someplace, but um, it, it needs to be you know, somewhat developed. And uh, if you have that, I would really welcome hearing from you. Uh, you can contact me at radio at uh, and, uh And if you do a little looking around um, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on my uh, show page, you'll, 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 you'll find my telephone number, my office number. And you can feel free to call me that uh, there as well. So well, I want to bring Scott back in. Are you there, Scott? I am. Okay, very good. So uh, what do you think about that? Um. About the social philosophers. Well, not, not oh. the social philosophers. Well, that's probably <laughs> that's something that you're not you know too familiar with, uh, even though you uh, you are the voice on the ad. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were afflicted with my voice. Yes. <laughs> but um, the idea of getting some um, cross fertilization of some of the shows, and it's not just here, but I mean in general, that's what I'm looking to do. I want to see. I think there's a wealth of resources. Um, that uh, if we can network uh, independent talents and independent viewpoints, uh, we can have something really interesting going. And, and I like to, uh, I agree, I, I like to, I'm losing count, trying to count quickly here in my head, how many PhDs we have as show hosts. Uh, at one time, we probably had as many PhDs as show hosts as any other Wi-Fi station in the world. Well, yeah. <laughs> A few of them have had their PhDs revoked. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> None of them have, but a couple aren't. You know, Dr. Faye Williams is not doing live shows anymore, but uh, it's a pleasure. You know, uh, content is king in the radio business, and uh, if you're not putting something out that people want to hear, it's not going to fly. That's why I like this show. This show is, appeals to a broad range of people with a broad range of interests. Yeah, you need to have some education, I suppose, to listen to this show, but I think it's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question or just kind of dodged it. Uh, well, no. So uh, let's, uh, I'm, I'm looking for some interchange and network of interchanging ideas and, um, and in, in, in various different menus because I think this is a, um, something that, that, that's been cooking for quite a while, but I, I think there's uh, potential for something really wonderful to come out of it because um, I think society needs that kick in the ass. And uh, sure, there are there are great shows like Coast to Coast AM and that type of thing, that are you know nation, nationwide national shows and that, that bring on people like this, um, you know, with interesting ideas. But I'm really talking about a, a, a kind of a, a networking that uh, generates um, a, a kind of um, culture uh, that impinges on the mainstream and is not totally separate. What we have here is, uh, in our society today is just this kind of uh, separation. And the two almost, re it's almost like they, 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 they're in two separate universes because uh, one, you know, the, the one doesn't take the other seriously. And yet by so doing, they are cutting themselves off from, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an influx of ideas and, uh, and stimulation that can um, have results that I think are very, very important for a free society. Anyway, um, Scott, I guess uh, this comes. This is the end of the uh, this broadcast. I really want to thank you for coming on the show, Scott. I Thanks. Really I'm sure it will be your lowest rated show of <laughs> all time, but we have to have a baseline, right? Uh, well, you know what? You're far too modest. I, I really, you know, I always love talking to you in our private conversations. And um, I hope we can do it again, Scott. It's been a okay. pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, for links to my book, uh, Ethical Empowerment, 
my philosophical counseling and hypnotherapy practice, and the Social Philosophizers Club. Please visit arthurdschwartz.com. And this is Arthur D. Schwartz reminding you to live well and think deeply. So until, we, uh, until next time, everybody, good night.